Sunday morning Bible study. God is good and awesome. And it's a privilege and an honor to be able to study God's word. And I pray that uh, our series of studies have been helping you uh, get closer to God. We have been talking about the attributes of God, various attributes of God. And it's designed for us to get to know God. Many times we talk about knowing God or wanting to know God, and the question really comes about, do we really know God? How much do we know about God? And so I pray that studying the attributes of God will help you and uh, will bless you and your faith that you get closer to knowing who God is. Before we get started, I want you to pray for Sister Legina Dunbar, who is asking prayer for her sister who was admitted into the hospital just a few days ago. Um, she is doing better, but she is still in need of our prayer. So I pray that, I ask that you pray for Sister Legina Dunbar, her sister, her brother uh, uh, Larry also in Alabama. Pray for all of her family, her mother. Continue to be with uh, that God will be, uh, bless her family in the various capacity and ways that they so need. Sister, uh, Sister Eartha McKinney is asking for prayers for herself um, and her family, her health. So continue to pray for Sister Eartha McKinney uh, that God will also bless her. Pray for uh, my mother uh, and as she will undergo surgery, that uh, the surgery will go well and that God will also bless her with healing. Pray for Sister Katrina Hall, Mildred Miles. Uh, Brother Urban Thomas, continue to pray for Brother Rudolph Jackson in the passing of his daughter. Continue to pray for uh, Richard Lee in the passing of his mother. So let us keep many of our saints in prayers. Continue to pray for all of those who stand in need. Continue to, again, congratulations to Legina and Ron Dunbar on their beautiful wedding ceremony that they had a uh, weekend, weekend uh, to so ago. Continue to pray for many of our, our couples, our young couples. We have uh, several new uh, young couples who are married uh, and in the body of Christ, uh, Eric and Jayla Riley, uh, Kia and Trey, uh, Cal and Megan, uh, Hope. Uh, we, my church, we have so many. We have so much to be thankful for. There are many. I pray that you are able to get to know them soon. Um, if you haven't already, but we have many new faces. God has been blessing us with conversions. People have been getting baptized through, while in the pandemic. So God is still moving. God is still working. He's still awesome. Uh, in spite of what the devils may say, God is still God. And so uh, I'm going to believe God over man. And so I pray that you will as well. We have, been, we have been in the, the patience of God. This is the attribute that we have been looking at. We have, we have studied um, uh, the patience of Jesus in his earthly ministry, the patience of Jesus in the, on the cross. We've studied the, how the patience of Jesus reflects the character of God. And then how that patience uh, reflects or shouldn't be reflected in our own lives, being that we are disciples of Christ, we are followers of the Lord Jesus, it, it is imperative that we also display the patience of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we've seen where this patience is seen in two aspects, patience enduring uh, the patience hupomane of dealing with a uh, difficult, troublesome circumstances. And then we saw in the last study, we saw macrothumia, and we'll look at another few, uh, couple of passages of scripture that will speak to that, and our ability to deal with, have patience with difficult people. And so let us look at Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5. Now in verse 16, Paul says, but I say, walk in the spirit. Well, actually, let's back up to verse 13. Paul says, for you were called to freedom. 
Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So now notice, Paul says, we have been freed in Christ. We are forever free in Christ. But that freedom leads us to now service. And so Paul says, this freedom is not a freedom for you to live loosely, wildly, without restraints. This freedom in Christ actually lends to us or leads us into serve the service of Christ. And he says, we ought to serve one another. We are free now to serve one another in Christ. He says, but then we ought to do it through love. Now, the next thing he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. He says, there isn't any love in this. The freedom that you have in Christ is to love one another and to serve one another by love. He says, but to devour and to bite one another, he says, let us be careful that we aren't consuming one another. We aren't destroying one another and miss the purpose of Christ and the freedom in Christ to serve him. He says, but now, here's what's going to enable you to serve one another in love and to live within the freedom you have with Christ. He says, walk by the Spirit. And you will not carry out the desires or lust of the flesh. He says, now, the reason that's so is because the flesh will set itself against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So then when we bite and devour one another, when we, faith, when we abuse our Christian liberty in Christ, he says then that, is, that shows we are walking and living by and according to the flesh. See, biting and devouring, killing off one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, that's all flesh. That's not walking by the Spirit. That's all living according to the flesh, being led by Satan. He says, so that in, that what that demonstrates, that demonstrates a child of God who is actually still in bondage. To, to, to bite and devour, to spend time killing off another child of God, he says, that's really bondage. That's slavery. You are free in Christ. Now watch this. To serve one another in love. So when we serve one another, it doesn't give us time to bite and devour one another. When you are allowed, when you, when you use your Christian freedom and liberty in Christ to serve in love, you are now being led by the Spirit and it keeps you from giving opportunity to the flesh. When you put to work, uh, put yourself to work in good things, spiritual things, kingdom things, it doesn't allow you to be sucked in to, uh, to falsity. It doesn't allow you to be sucked into to murmuring, backbiting, and complaining. It doesn't allow you to be sucked in to other people's disgruntlements. It doesn't allow you to be uh, bought by uh, people's negativity. What it, what it does, it puts your focus on the things of others. You serve others. How so? Because I'm free in Christ. And I do it out of love. Listen, you don't, you don't do what you do. And I pray as children of God that this church will get to a point where and that you are so mature in your spiritual faith that you aren't working or doing what you do in Christian service because you're trying to make it to heaven. You do what you do. You, 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 you serve the way you serve because of love. That's the mark of Christian maturity. If I'm doing what I'm doing to stay out of hell, you miss the point. If I'm doing what I'm doing because I'm afraid God is going to put judgment on me, you miss the point. Christian maturity says I reverence God, I honor God, 
I recognize my freedom in Christ has allowed me now and it enabled me to serve my fellow man and to bring the service to Christ because of love. That's Christian maturity. And then I'm being led by the Spirit, which, which empowers me to do so. So, he says, this, this flesh, man, it sets war against the Spirit. It's always in opposition to the Spirit. It's always in a war against the Spirit, always fighting against the Spirit. That's what the flesh does. He says, but in verse 18, um, well, let's read verse 17 again. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice, live by, they have a habitual lifestyle of these fleshly uh, enmities, or these fleshly uh, uh, pictures, if you will. He says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, what is the fruit of the Spirit? He says, it's love. Remember, he just told them, make sure you serve one another in love. You have been freed in Christ. Serve one another in love. Then he says, remember, to be led by the Spirit brings about a fruit of the Spirit. What is it? Love is one of them. Joy is another. Peace is another. And according to our study, Patience, right? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, he says, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. He says, there is no, no love, there's no law for this. He says, this is being led by the Spirit. And being, and watch this. To be led by the Spirit is but to show forth the fruit of the Spirit. When a child of God is truly being led by the Spirit of God, then what comes out of his life, his work or his walk, what he does, how he lives, how he thinks, the fruit of the Spirit comes, it becomes evident. So now, and here's, you, it becomes so much a part of you that you don't think about it. It becomes second nature to you. It's so much a part of you that it becomes you, that you become love. You become joy, peace. You become a person of patience. You become kindness, goodness, but it consumes who you are. So now when you when you when people see you, when people interact with you and they come in contact with you, they ought to say, You are a person of love. You are a person of joy. You are a person of peace. You are a person of such patience. It's a part of your DNA. That's that's walking by the Spirit, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. Evidence. Of the Spirit of Almighty God. Uh, look at look at First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter five. In First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twelve says, "But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you." And have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. Lord have mercy. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. 
I live in peace, or, or excuse me, uh, live in peace with one another. Fruit of the Spirit, remember? Paul says, live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, watch it, and be patient with everyone. Look at Christian service, church. Paul just said, you are free in Christ to the Galatians. You are free to serve one another in love. Then he says, and make sure that your walk in the spirit is, is uh, evident by the fruit you bear, right? He says, but here, let me show you, let me, let me help the Thessalonians. He says, we urge you, brethren, to admonish the unruly. In other words, don't allow uh, unruly Christians to tear up God's church. Don't allow Christians who do not want to live by the standard of God to cause dissension, distractions, and divisions in the Lord's church. He says, so admonish them. That's free. That's being freed in Christ. Right? And it also shows love for one another, more importantly, your love for Christ. He says, so admonish the unruly and encourage. Look at being free in Christ does. He says, you encourage the faint-hearted. The Christians, I'm trying to tell you, when you are free in Christ, you don't you don't have time to bite and devour one another. When you spend time encouraging the faint-hearted, you don't have time for negativity. You don't have time for pessimism. You don't have time for unbelieving ch church folk. What you have is your, your time being consumed with encouraging the faint-hearted. But if you aren't one who encourages the faint-hearted, he says, make sure you are one who helps the weak. Look at the service rendered. But here's the, here's the catch to it. That service done in love. You aren't doing it because you're commanded to do it. You aren't doing it because it's, you're afraid of going to hell if you don't do it. You do this because of love. You have a spirit of helping the weak. You have a spirit and a heart of encouraging the faint-hearted. You have courage to deal with the unruly who cause dissension and break up and steal and try to rob the peace of other saints. That's what your calling is as a child of God. Then he says to them, notice, be patient. With not certain people, not your children, not people in your family, not your spouse. He says, be patient, or not just your spouse and just your family, but rather be patient with everyone. Look at that. Macrothumia. Be patient even with difficult foes. Be patient with them. And you know what helps you be patient with them? When you, when, you, when, you, when you are patient with difficult people, but you spend your energy on helping somebody, encouraging the faint-hearted, right? Giving strength to someone in need. That's what keeps you away from, or, or from expending energy on people who don't want to do right. He says, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. And when you, and listen church, you, you don't have time for that either. When you're helping other people, when you're, when you're being a blessing to someone else, you don't have time to repay evil for evil. But always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Not just the Christians, not just those you like, not just those who you speak to. He says for all people. Uh -huh. uh, rejoice always. <laughs> Church, you don't have time. When you, when, you are, when you have this kind of mindset, a lot of other foolishness, a lot of stuff that's trivial, a lot of stuff that makes no sense a lot of time, you don't have time for all of that because it zaps your energy, steals your joy, robs you of your peace. You don't have time for that, especially when you are one who's always rejoicing. When you are a child of God, constantly rejoicing in the blessings of God, 
the favor of God, the power of God, when you, and the awesomeness of God, when you spend your time rejoicing in how great and good God has been to you, how, how, how merciful he is toward you, sure, you ain't got it. You don't have time for the other stuff because you don't want the other stuff to rob you of the blessed stuff. You don't want that. So he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ. And do not quench the spirit. Let's look at this. Let's look at how we, uh, this patience and the enduring, let's look at that uh, in, in regards to suffering. Now, we remember we talked about macrothumia, patience in regard to difficult people. Now, well, let's look at, let's, let's reiterate what we've said concerning patience uh, in difficult people as well as suffering. Let me get there. First Peter, we've looked at this previously, but let's look at it again for emphasis sake. First Peter chapter uh, 2, I believe it is. First Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice verse number 17. Uh, these things spring out uh, springs, these are springs without water. He's talking about false prophets. Mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they, the false prophets, they entice by fleshly desires by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, and by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse than the first. Now, uh, I just need you to know that's actually not the scripture that I wanted. I wanted 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. But since I read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, I need you to know something. He talks about being entangled again. God has freed you from something. God has delivered you from false teaching, false prophet. God has delivered you from the world. And why would you want to be entangled again? Now, here's the, here's the thing. We just spent, we've just spent time talking about being free in Christ, serving one another in love. Why in the world would you want to go back to the very thing that entangled you? Why would you want to be around the spirit of people in the church that you once were in the world. I'm trying to tell you, you got to be careful. You may have left that type of spirit in the world with people, in your family, on your job. The last thing Christians, true Christians want is to come and be entangled with other Christians and be yoked up in bondage with the same thinking, same spirit, same attitude that they left in the world. I just needed to drop that on you seeing that I had read the wrong scripture. But it was good anyhow because he says, why would you want to, if you've escaped the defilements of the world, and, and by, watch this, the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you escape the entanglements, which means the knowledge of Jesus Christ have freed you. He says, oh, then, then, then why be entangled again? The last state. Worse than the first. Verse 21, he says, For it would be better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandments handed on them. Now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse, verse uh, 15 says, for, the, for such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as, look at it, free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. But 
use it as bond slaves to God or of God. Honor all people. Love the brethren. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but all those, also those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up, there it is, they bear up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. He says, you're going to be, on, there, there may be some slaves mistreated by their masters. He says, the Christians, on the other hand, you're being mistreated by Nero, his craziness, his hatefulness of Christians, his, 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 his bloodthirsty power, a uh, hunger for power, his ego, he's an egomaniac. He says he won't hesitate to kill a Christian at, at, just at the drop of a dime, at the snap of a finger. He says, you're going to be persecuted. Look at that. He says, you will be persecuted. He says, but this finds favor with God even when you suffer unjustly. He says, you're going to endure it. Look at that, church. You endure the unjust. Well, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, he says you endure that with patience. But if when you do what is right, you suffer for it, watch it, you patiently endure it. He says, now, just as sure as when you are wrong, you know you're wrong, you admit that you're wrong, you suffer the consequences, you suffer the punishment, you endure that. He says, well, by the same token, I want the child of God who does right by men, who finds favor in the sight of God, he says, you must endure unjustly with patience or unjustice with patience. For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his footsteps. And while being reviled, Jesus did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteous. Look at, look at, uh, that's enduring, church. Look at Luke chapter 8. Look, look at what Jesus says in the parable of Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 says, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. And when the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. That's why some people, they hear the word, realize it's truth being taught to them, but a certain time, they wait on obeying the gospel. They delay it, and then all of a sudden, they give time for the devil to come away, come in and snatch away the word. Same with Christians. Sit and hear the word of God. You listen to the word of God, but you don't make application to the word of God. You know what happens? Satan comes along and snatches it. Then those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and then watch it in the time of temptation, they fall away. They have no firm root. That, that's, the, that's the story of some Christians today. They come to worship, they, they assemble for worship, they listen to the word, and they walk out, and that word never takes firm root in their life. They, when temptation comes, when, when things get a little heated in life, they fall away. Well, he says, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries, riches, pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. I just told you, Paul said, when we're free in Christ, God expects us to manifest and, and bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. He says, but these, they get caught up with the cares of the world, 
the pleasures of the world, he says, and all the while, that world, worldliness, should I say, snatches, digs up, and uproots the word of God out of their heart, and then they do not bring forth fruit. Well, he says, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and here's what they do. They hold fast to it. They grab it, and they never let that word leave their heart. They keep it. As a matter of fact, they put more word in their heart daily. They hold it fast. And then they bear fruit. Watch it, though. They bear fruit with patience. So unlike the others, he says, they grab hold to the word. They receive it with joy. They, 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 they are blessed by it. They grab a hold to it. And even when trials come, when the cares of the world come, when the pleasures of the world are trying to tempt them and, and, and pull them back out into the world, he says, they hold fast to the word. It's the word that keeps them. It's the word that will guide them. It's the word that will feed them. It's the word that sustains them. He said, they hold fast to this word and they maintain it with patience. Yeah, with patience, church. That's what they do with it. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5. And we'll, 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 we'll land the plane with Romans chapter 5. But I need you to know something. Look at Romans chapter 5. Paul says, therefore... Being justified by faith, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's, that's the gospel. Justification by faith in Christ. That's the gospel, church. I now have a I'm peace. I'm at peace with God. I'm not fighting. I'm not his enemy anymore. I'm justified. God has declared me righteous even though I'm unrighteous, even though I must depend solely on the righteousness of Christ. God puts on my account righteousness. And as a result, I'm at peace with God. He says, though, this peace comes through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace which we stand, we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, he says, but we also exalt in our tribulations. We boast in our tribulations knowing that these tribulations bring about something. They bring about perseverance, endurance, patience. He says, and, and perseverance brings about proven character. The character that, have, that has withstood the test. And the only way you can withstand the test is by enduring the trial with patience. And then what enables you to endure the trial with patience is the grace, Paul said, wherein we stand. We live in a sphere of grace. And it's that grace that enables us to stand, withstand, Endure, bear up with patience the trial. And as a result, my character, my character is transformed. My character sanctified. My character takes on a new person, if you will. Because I endured with patience. I won't, won't go to uh, uh, any other scriptures, but I want you to for, for, for your own time, look at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 5, 1 through 8. Uh, and then look at, go back and look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. And then when it comes to having patience, we need to have patience when it comes for the second coming of the Lord. Look at 1 Peter, Romans chapter 8. Uh, all of it, from, you can probably start at verse 17 through verse 25. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Look at, look at how Paul speaks of the patience needed for the waiting of the coming of our Lord. And then other examples of Christ Jesus being uh, an example of patience. Uh, when, when, when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Or actually, 3 through 11. First, that's, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. 
And then 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. I pray that you've been blessed by this character study, this attribute study of our Lord and our God. And I pray that uh, you will continue to study with me because we're going to move into another attribute concerning the mercy of God. And so uh, I've been eager, uh, anticipating that study, as all of them. But I want you to, uh, to I, want, I pray that you're blessed by this, this, these blessings of attributes that God communicates to us. And so I pray that uh, you will actually try to apply them to your life um, uh, with all, at all means possible. Join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your blessings of patience. I thank you for your kindness, mercy, and your grace. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing through us and will continue to do through us and in us. Father, I pray that you will bless those who are sick and afflicted, that you heal them, Father, give them the strength, the health that they so need. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless those caretakers, those who are looking after them with strength that they need and stamina, Father, to continue to look after their loved ones. Father, help us to be a people that although we are free in Christ, we are free to love one another and to serve one another. Help us to be that kind of people. Change our mindsets, Father. Change our hearts that we will, we will render service to thee out of love. Father, we pray and ask that you continue to bless all of the area congregations, bless the Liberty City Church, and bless our efforts here, Father, that we will continue to do what you have called us to do. We give you glory. We love you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.